Hi, and welcome to this next topic of OCR A-level chemistry. It's topic 15, alkanes. A lot of the stuff in this topic we've seen before, but we've seen it in different places, and it's kind of linked together with other topics. And it's useful to talk about those links, because they might make those links in exams, or they might make different links in exams. It's always good to know what topics relate to what other topics. So first of all, we need to know that alkanes are saturated hydrocarbons, so they contain only carbon, carbon single bonds, and carbon hydrogen single bonds. Those single bonds, because the electron density is between the two atoms, are called sigma bonds. A sigma bond is one where if you look along the bond, so if you have an atom here, an atom there, and I'm looking along the bond from this side, then the shape is circular. So the same way as if you look at an S orbital, then it looks circular from any side. If you look along a bond, which is a single bond, it looks circular in terms of where the electrons are, and that is a sigma bond. Sigma is the Greek letter S, so that's quite an easy way to remember. A sigma bond is any single bond. And also you need to know that you can rotate around a sigma bond. Because it's between the atoms, it has no limit on the way that those atoms rotate along that bond's axis. So here I've got butane, or a molecule of butane with a molymod, and you can see that each of the sigma bonds can rotate. So literally every single bond in this molecule is able to rotate. Now that's not true of other bonds, and you'll see that when we do alkenes, but all the bonds in an alkane can rotate. And so there's many different ways of showing this molecule. It doesn't change it, which is why when we went through naming, it matters only how far from the end a group was, not what the molecule looked like, because there's lots and lots of ways of organising it and drawing. And hopefully you can also see that each of these carbons is making four bonds. So it's four bonding pairs, there's no lone pairs, and so the shape around each of the carbon atoms is tetrahedral, with bond angles of 109.5. That's linking back to the bonding and structure topic. Also, you'll probably notice from GCSE, but methane has the lowest boiling point of all of the alkanes, then ethane, then propane, then butane, etc. So as you increase the number of carbons, you increase the boiling point. And the reason that happens is because as you increase the number of carbons, you increase the number of electrons that are in that molecule, and so you increase the induced dipole-dipole forces of attraction between those molecules, and so you have a higher melting point because you need to put more energy in to break those forces apart. The other thing which increases the boiling point of an alkane would be how little branching it's got. The fewer branches there are on an alkane, the higher its melting point will be. So if I draw some isomers of C5H12, or I'll draw all the isomers of C5H12, and I'll show you which one's got the highest boiling point, which one's got the lowest boiling point. Okay, I've drawn these before. It's pentane, methyl butane, and dimethyl propane. And the one which has the fewest branches, so pentane, will have the highest boiling point. And the one that's got the highest number of branches will also have the lowest boiling point. So the longer and thinner the shape is, the bigger the dipole that can be created instantaneously by the random movement of electrons. And so you get bigger dipoles and then bigger induced dipoles and so stronger forces. The more round the molecule is, the smaller the dipoles that are created instantaneously and so the lower the boiling point is. Now there's very few reactions that alkanes do. The only one that you really know already is combustion, but that's not anything special. Almost all organic compounds will combust. That doesn't mean we don't have to talk about it. In fact, you need to be able to write a balanced symbol equation for the combustion of any alkane that they give you. So I'll go through one example of those. Yeah, so I'll start with complete combustion, because it's the easiest one. And I'll do pentane, because I've already got it. There are five carbons in pentane, and so you get five carbon dioxide. And there are 12 hydrogens in pentane, so you end up with six waters, because each water has two hydrogens. To work out the number of oxygens, you just add up the number of oxygens on this side, and then divide by two. So 10 for the carbon dioxide, six for the water is 16. Divide that by two, and you have eight oxygen molecules. You also should be able to do that if you're creating carbon monoxide, so I'll quickly go through that. So all I've done is replace carbon dioxide with carbon monoxide, there's still five carbons, and you still get five carbon monoxide. There's still 12 hydrogens, and I still get six waters. But this time, I've only got 11 oxygen atoms on that side, so I need to have 
11 over 2 oxygen molecules on this side. You could also write that as 5 and a half, that's fine. Or you can double everything, so you get 2 pentanes plus 11 oxygen makes 10 carbon monoxide plus 12 waters, so that's fine as well. Now the reason why alkanes don't do much, they don't do many organic reactions, I mean we haven't seen any organic reactions yet, but we'll see a lot, there's about 12 or 13 in this first AS unit alone. And the reason why alkanes don't do many types of reactions, they combust, they do one other thing which I'll show you later, they don't do anything else. And the reason for that is because their bonds are all very stable, it's got a high bond enthalpy. And the next thing I'll do is the one reaction which they do do. And that reaction is called free radical substitution and write up our very first reaction mechanism. Remember, a reaction mechanism is something which shows you what happened to each of the atoms and the molecules in a chemical reaction, not just the reactants and what you end up with. It's every step in between. Okay, so free radical substitution is a reaction between an alkane and a halogen. It's called free radical or radical because it contains radicals, which are species with an unpaired electron. And it's called substitution because one of the hydrogens from the alkane is substituted with one of the halogens. So that means they swap over. So one example of this would be methane, which is the alkane reacting with chlorine, which is the halogen. What happens is the chlorine and one of the hydrogens swap over. So your products would be chloromethane and hydrogen chloride. And this is the overall equation. So it just shows you reactants and products. What we need to be able to do is every step in between. So how did these reactants come to be these products? And that is called the reaction mechanism. The first thing to know is that this doesn't happen in normal circumstances. So if I mix together these two gases and left them, they wouldn't react with each other. Even if I heated them up, they wouldn't react with each other. And it's because you need one specific condition to start the whole reaction off. And that condition is shining ultraviolet light onto it. And that starts the whole reaction off. And so that step is called the initiation step. Initiation from initiate or start. And what happens when you shine UV light on this is that one of the chlorine molecules or some of the chlorine molecules, not all of them, just actually quite a small proportion of the chlorine molecules will split homolytically to get two chlorine radicals. Now I drew this in the last video. One of the electrons from the bond goes to each of the chlorine. They both end up with one, they're atoms, and they're called radicals because there's only seven electrons in the outer shell, which means one of them is unpaired. And that's why this is a radical substitution, because it requires radicals to work. Now the next thing that happens is one of these chlorine radicals will react with a methane. And radicals are very reactive. As soon as they touch a methane, as soon as they collide with another molecule, they will immediately react with it. And in this case, the chlorine will make a bond with the first thing it touches, which will be a hydrogen in this case, because hydrogen is on the outside. And so that creates hydrogen chloride. So the reaction that happens when a chlorine radical touches a hydrogen is they bond together. You get hydrogen chloride. But this bond then breaks between the carbon and the hydrogen, and you end up with a methyl radical. So a CH3, and the carbon has an unpaired electron. So I need to put that here as well. And in this reaction, you see you go from having one radical to having one radical, and we've made a product during that process. So hydrogen chloride, that's one of the actual products. The next thing that happens is this methyl radical will collide with something and react with it. And the only thing that it can collide with at this point to make a reaction is a chlorine. And when it does that, the methyl radical will react with the chlorine to make chloromethane. And in the same way as the last one, the methyl radical has reacted with the chlorine, this bond has broken, leaving chloromethane, but also a chlorine radical. Now, if you've got keen eyes, you'll see that this process can just repeat and repeat and repeat. So this chlorine radical, it could just then react with another methane. And the product of that reaction will be a hydrogen chloride and a methyl radical. Then that methyl radical can react with another chlorine to make chloromethane and a chlorine radical. And then the process just repeats over and over again, reacting with the methane and the chlorine. So that's the two reactants and producing hydrogen chloride and chloromethane, so the two products. And the name that's given to these two steps, uh, but they're propagation steps. They're the ones which just continue the reaction, making the products and using up the reactants. And so that will just continue until all the reactants have been used. And there's specific ways the reaction stops, because 
radicals are so reactive, they'll just continue to react with things. But if two radicals meet, then they will react with each other. The two unpaired electrons become paired, and so you have no radicals at the end. And those steps are called termination steps. And there's three main ones that happen. A chlorine radical reacting with another chlorine radical, a chlorine radical reacting with a methyl radical, or two methyl radicals reacting with each other. I'm going to ignore two of those now, because two of those give me one of the things from the overall equation, and the other one gives me something completely different, so a product that I don't want. So you can see if two chlorine radicals react together, you just make a chlorine molecule. And the chlorine molecule is one of my reactants. It can split later with some ultraviolet light, or it could react with a methyl radical to make chloromethane and chlorine. It's all just part of the reaction. Another thing that can happen is one of the chlorine radicals can react with a methyl radical that makes chloromethane and no other radicals. And those steps are called termination steps. And they're called termination steps because they remove radicals from the reaction mixture. We need radicals for the whole thing to work. That's why these are the propagation steps where you use one radical, you make a radical, use that and make the first one again. And that cyclical process. These ones at the beginning create radicals. So you go from having zero radicals to having two. A termination reaction does the exact opposite. It goes from having two radicals to having no radicals. And so that stops this radical mechanism. Now the other one that I said is kind of a limitation to this process. In any chemical reaction, you have reactants and you want products. And you do the chemical reaction because you want these products. And what I said as the third way of stopping this reaction, the third termination step, would be reacting two methyl radicals together. And that creates ethane. And ethane is not one of the products. It's not one of the reactants. It's something which shouldn't be in the reaction. And so it's a limitation. It stops the reaction from being so useful because that ethane you've got to remove at the end. And this is the limitation that they often ask you to draw an equation for, or write an equation for. And it's because it's so similar to these ones. It kind of makes sense logically. Now the other ones that they can ask you for, they won't ask you to write equations for, they'll just ask you what other limitations there might be. And to do that, I need to explain what's going on in the reaction mixture. When this first chlorine radical is made, it could collide with only two things. It could collide with a methane, in which case this reaction would happen, or it could collide with a chlorine molecule. And a chlorine molecule reacting with a chlorine radical makes a chlorine radical and a chlorine molecule. And that's exactly the same thing as we started off with. And so that chlorine radical just needs to collide with something. The only thing that it can collide with at the beginning is a methane. And that starts this whole propagation step off. Now once you start making products in the same flask that you've got your reactants and your radicals, those radicals can collide with anything. Those radicals could collide with one of your products. And when that happens, it's possible that this chloromethane can turn into dichloromethane, or trichloromethane, or tetrachloromethane. So you have more than one substitution happening, and those all need to be removed from the reaction as well. And so this reaction is actually not very good. If you want a way of making chloromethane, this isn't a great way, because you make chloromethane, sure, but you also make a bunch of other things, like ethane, and dichloromethane, trichloromethane, and that's not what you want. And you've got to remove that from the end and it just costs you money. Now, other things that can happen, I use methane, and so there's only one place that you can substitute on methane, and that's on the only carbon that there is. With ethane, that's also the same. If you take a hydrogen off, it's always off of the end carbon. But as soon as you get to propane, then you've got more than one place that you can substitute. You can substitute one of the six hydrogens on the end carbon, or one of the two hydrogens on the centre carbon. And that way you make both one chloropropane and two chloropropane. And that problem just gets worse the bigger that you make your molecule. So pentane, you can get one chloro, two chloro, or three chloro. And those are just the mono substitutors. You can also get further substitution. One one dichloropentane, one two dichloropentane, one three dichloropentane, one four dichloropentane, one five. There is so many once you get to large alkanes that this reaction kind of becomes useless. And the only time that I can imagine them ever asking this question would be if you had methane or if you had ethane reacting with a halogen. Because all the rest of the time, there's so many other things that can happen that it becomes almost pointless to write out all of the mechanisms. But you need to be aware of those limitations. And on the specification, it says that this synthesis 
forms a mixture of organic compounds, and it specifically mentions further substitution and reactions at different places on the carbon chain. This mechanism, I'm pretty sure I've said it before, is called free radical or just radical substitution. Radical, obviously, because of all the radicals that we've got involved, and substitution because we're swapping a chlorine and a hydrogen ring. And that's everything from the topic about alkanes. I hope you can join me for the next one. Goodbye.